even my parents knows that. And I'm a carpet analyst for 15 years. And now they understand my job <laughs> uh, after China announced the pledge. If you don't like ads and want to support the show, click the Patreon link in the show notes and subscribe for an ad-free feed. Power outages, coal power investment restrictions, and carbon trading? Plus China? Yen Chin is a carbon analyst at Refinitiv based in Norway, here to explain all that and more. Co-host is my Rhodium colleague, Irina Leo. Welcome to China Talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's start with what's in the news this week, power outages. How did we get here? Maybe it's best to start with, um, you know, a brief history of, of China's energy mix and how it's, how it's changed over time. Yeah, thanks. It's a very good time for having this podcast to one really a lot of folks are China energy policy and following the power shortages in some provinces. And I would stress it's regionally. It's not like, I mean, I've seen the title saying China back to Stone Age. I said, okay, hey, my parents video, I mean, that's so exaggerated. Okay. I myself said there are over 20 provinces are curbing power partly to some industries in some cities for a few hours, right? But of course. This is, I mean, yeah, officially we call it the uh, worst uh, episode of power uh, shortages uh, or to the, the extent it's so widespread. So this is the worst in a decade. So that is precise um, because previously, yes, I mean, back to, I can be back to 20 years ago since I'm also I'm old enough to remember that in 2002 and also in 2010, there were a few uh, occasions where there have been uh, power shortages in some provinces and as late as in December or as near as in December 2020, where we have cold snap and we have power shortages in the central, in Hunan and Jiangxi, etc. So yeah, it is true it's happening more frequent, but overall, I mean, if we look at a broad eye view of China's energy mix, uh, China is a country rich in coal supply and coal is supplying more than 60% of the China's power supply and we say 50 so it's more than half of the country's energy consumption so that shows how the energy mix is and, uh, and this picture has changed a bit in the past 20 years I and mean, we've all heard of how renewables is building so fast etc but uh, currently, coal is still dominating in China's energy mix. And this, that's why it always puts uh, China in the uh, spotlight in terms of climate policy. So why does China go through so many episodes of power outages? It seems like it happens quite often in the winter. Yeah. So I think that, uh, I mean, uh, history does repeat a little bit. Uh, when in 22 and 2010, that is when China had rapid economic expansion. So uh, industrial grows rapidly, and of course, then you need a lot of energy. We are, I mean, industry still uh, consuming more than half of China's energy consumption. Uh, yeah, so with such a energy intensive, uh, let's say, uh, economic structure, the demand for energy is enormous. So that's why there have been outages that were short uh, energy supply previously. But um, I think there are specific reasons for what happening now and what happened in December 2020. Uh, this is also showing where uh, the country is transitioning to a more renewable-based uh, energy mix. So I mean, green transition is the theme all of the world, which is uh, definitely considering what we have to do to save the globe, to save the earth. So uh, yes, that's what's necessary. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when we have very stretched uh, on the uh, supply side, so we are facing out fossil fuel. But this year we have uh, a strong rebound post-COVID. Again, it's happening not only in China, but globally. So supply cannot meet short-term surge in demand. And then we have a Z crunch. Yeah, it seems like the whole world is going through an energy crisis right now. Do you feel like there are any similarities between like the petrol sh shortages in Europe with what's happening in China? Yeah, uh, yeah. Me, I myself, as I said, I'm based in Norway, I was analyzing China climate uh, policy. I mean, right now there are similarities in uh, Europe. I mean, UK specific with that petrol shortage and that's a bit logistics challenges we have seen. Uh, but in Europe, energy prices 
are increasing. In Norway, our power price, even, even though in Norway it's almost 100% uh, hydroelectricity, power prices has increased this year considerably compared to last year, and the same for all European countries. Every day is almost a new record. So all of our utility bills will be more expensive this winter than previously. So it's, I mean, there, this is part of it is global. Globally, gas prices are increasing. Coal prices uh, are increasing. And so there are some factors definitely uh, common uh, around the globe. So it's, it's like when everyone is buying at the same time. I, I'm curious, Yen, because this seems like a very dramatic thing to happen that, you know, futures markets should have like priced in or something like are there were there like big exogenous shocks that led to what's happening right now or just like a lot of like different sort of streams of things happening, building up to something like this. And, you know, if it's the if it's the latter or the former sort of what does that say about the health of the global, I don't know, energy chain? I'm an energy market analyst, so this really goes to my heart because I work with traders a lot. <laughs> there are uh, many parts, and uh, uh, but we call it a perfect storm. Uh, to be started with, me as a market analyst, I haven't exactly predicted this sharp rise or triple in prices. I mean, I would have started a hedge fund if I correct <laughs> with that. Uh, or I would hedge my house's electricity bill last year at a fixed price, which is one third now. But uh, with the sharp rise is uh, surprised uh, most people in the market. Um, I think what's really is a lot of us has underestimated uh, when you have a mixture of uh, many factors uh, at the same time. Uh, so, of course, I mean, as I said just now, uh, when the whole world is recovering from uh, COVID restrictions, industrial are recovering. Uh, of course, the demand for energy is rising. Uh, and secondly, this year was a bit special. We have, uh, in terms of uh, weather impact, when Europe is moving to a more uh, more renewable-based power system, so we are more depending on wind turbines and solar panels. But uh, in terms of weather conditions, this year what they are less. Uh, there are days with very low wind, uh, and also in Norway, in Spain, in the Alps, they are having less uh, rain, less snow and rain. So it's like everything tilts to the same direction. Well, of course, in Norway, we're happy when it's sunny and nice weather, but now we see that it's what leads to more expensive energy prices. Okay, so, so what's the worst day for a renewable energy? It's like cloudy with no wind and no rain? Yes. And as I think what also happens is we call it when you have in the summer, when you have heat wave, that's where uh, it's always in the steel day. So heat wave, that's when your energy demand, your power demand is uh, high and but at the same time still. And the same can happen in the winter. And that's part of the reason we have the uh, winter power shortages in central China in last December. It's uh, in the cold snap and there's less wind as well. And this also similar is actually what's happening in, in northeast China in uh, last weekend as well. How do these power outages generally relate to China's climate energy situation? Are we going to be seeing a lot more power outages as China tries to transition to carbon neutrality? How to ensure reliability and decarbonization goes hand in hand. But uh, basically, I think ensuring enough energy supply is still the top priority for the energy system going green. That is inevitable. Well, I think now it's really a short term pain. I think what has, I mean, I was often asked, uh, or in the past weeks was asked many times, uh, does this round of China's power shortage, uh, does it relate to its climate policy? And uh, then I say, partly. Uh, because in the past, uh, so why China has a power shortage, which in essence is actually a coal shortage, because power plants cannot get sufficient coal supply. So they can only run, I mean, what's reported in northern China, probably they're running half of the capacity and they have to save coal for the upcoming winter season. And so why I said China as a coal producing country has a coal shortage? Uh, well, the, it, it is really in the past, for one, it's really the rapid and more uh, sharp rise in coal demand this year. 
also that is above the increase in coal production and even plus imports. Well, then uh, why China's coal production has slowed down? That is because partly because climate and environmental policies in the past years, where China has closed down uh, a lot of uh, aging coal mines, of course, they are unsafe to operate and putting more strict uh, safety and environmental rules as well on the uh, coal mines, they're producing less. In the past years, the theme is doing green transition and uh, have climate and environmental policy dominated. Uh, yeah, and so let's let's take a step back. Can you do a sort of brief overview of Xi and climate policy? Like, why why is he focused on this? And and you know, maybe how would you grade his commitment to um, to reducing China's carbon footprint over the past few years? I mean, we hear a lot about China's climate pledge, but what's really significant uh, is that so China accounts for thirty percent of global uh, carbon emissions, and it's the biggest emitter. And uh, also, its per capita emissions also rising. And so, yes, it means China needs to take more responsibility in tackling climate change. In the last September, was really significant on twenty second September in twenty twenty. So Chinese president pledged that China will strive to achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. So this is like 10 years behind what the European Union has pledged. But I mean, given the size of China, etc., I mean, that's the first time. Last September was the first time China announced a carbon a year of carbon neutrality. So that is huge. And in addition, and China also, or Chinese president also announced China will aim to peak carbon emissions before 2030. I mean, that really signals China is willing to contribute more to the Paris Agreement, to global climate efforts. I mean, it's estimated that with China's carbon neutrality pledge, we could already contribute to reduce uh, global warming by around uh, 0.2 to 0.3 decrease simply because the size of uh, China or the large share of its emissions. So it's very significant. And, uh, and over the, I mean, since last September, in the past years, we have seen China gradually making more pledges, building upon the carbon neutrality uh, goal. So I say China uh, has set new 2030 climate targets. China will tripling its wind and solar installed capacity by 2030. So basically install, installing at least 100 gigawatts the combined wind and solar capacity per year. Now, I mean, as recent, we've also uh, heard at latest uh, in the latest United Nations General Assembly where China announced it will stop building new coal-fired plants abroad. Um, so, I mean, this is uh, injecting a lot of good momentum ahead of uh, the climate summit, ahead of COP26 in Glasgow in a month's time or end of this month. So that's a brief summary of China's climate pledge and why it matters. Why is this even happening in the first place? Is Beijing just doing this out of the goodness of their heart? Like what is the kind of internal political economy within China, which is, which are driving these commitments? No, I, I think that that's September, uh, that commitment really surprised most of climate watchers and really welcomed the message. I think they are, uh, the outcome will be beneficial, let's say, for global uh, climate efforts. But I think there are uh, indeed a lot of, as you said, uh, internal political and economic incentives as well. And to start with, I think Chinese leadership is more aware of the impacts of climate change on China. I mean, we are saying that with global warming, with probably uh, two degree warming, uh, many coastal cities in China, they will be under sea levels, including Shanghai. That's why I studied. But, but Yen, I thought we're supposed to develop the West. <laughs> That's... <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. fair. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, uh, and second, exactly as you mentioned, develop the West. So which means China, uh, as actually as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, in the past, I mean, since 1978, Reform, uh, opening and reform of Chinese economy. Uh, then uh, China's economy has been heavily relying on uh, industry, or especially the more energy intensive. In um, and when in the world, almost everything is made in China. 
but now China has to transform its economic structure as well, really to change from more uh, industry-based or industry-stimulated economic growth to more like service or high-tech industry-based as in the West. So I think industrial transformation uh, is also part uh, of the reason. It's more densely populated on the east coast, as we call them as load center, or most energy will be consumed on the east. But then now it's also a process of, of moving more industry to the west. And why? Because of China's renewable resources are more abundant in the west. So here's why uh, we need to move to the west as well. So I guess my question is, how much of it do you think we can actually see from these pledges? Do you think they'll actually follow through with it? Or is there just a lot of virtue signaling? No, I think we have to see what China really pledged. It's always a very short <laughs> sentence at any big UN conference or in China's People's Congress, etc. But all these short sentences, they will be followed. They will be guidelines for the upcoming policies. So that's why they send us this pledge. It's very short, but I believe they will be followed because what's important is they dominate the upcoming policies. So as an example is last September after China announced carbon neutrality pledge, carbon neutral really become a huge, huge buzzword. I mean, that, that's because fever, it's really spreading much faster than I've seen Europe, even Europe in 2019 or since 2019 has been uh, discussing that there were targets, etc. We have a green deal, etc. But uh, carbon, carbon neutral has become such a hot topic in such a short time and that is influencing uh, policies, uh, etc. So I think this will change. Between China's real estate worries, rising inflation, and the pandemic disrupting global markets, finding promising investments is harder than ever. But billionaires and institutional investors won't be caught off guard. In fact, they've been prepared for years. The smartest investors protect their portfolios with uncorrelated assets like contemporary art. And for the first time ever, you don't need large amounts of capital to invest in art. Masterworks is the only platform that lets you invest in the very same multi-million dollar masterpieces as billionaire collectors. The world's most famous artists like Kusama and Banksy, all available on the Masterworks platform. They've just received a valuation of over a billion dollars, making them the first and only unicorn in the alternative investing world. The wait list to join Masterworks and their over 200,000 members is extensive, but I've partnered with them to get a few VIP passes for you all to skip to the front. Just head to masterworks.io slash China Talk to secure your spot. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. C- continuing on Irina's question, what, what aspect of sort of foreign policy flows into this? There's some people have been making arguments that you know, doing these announcements on the world stage and, and, and sort of responding to a lot of the criticism that, uh, you know, foreign analysts have had, particularly when it comes to, uh, funding coal fired power plants abroad, um, is partially sort of a push to improve China's, uh, China's image and demonstrate it's like commitment as a global player. To what extent do you think those sorts of incentives are driving these policies as much as, you know, what you were saying about people being scared Shanghai is going to be underwater? And I think that's, or like uh, reputation, reputation internationally is part of it. But I think I want to, or in my view, I do not think Chinese policymakers get too much of what about Western media are discussing. <laughs> so that's really, yeah. Um, but I think in terms of reputation, I mean that uh, in global climate negotiations, China is representing developing countries. So I think, right, China, so in every uh, climate summit and China is stressing, we need to have a common but differentiated responsibilities because developed countries, they have been, I mean, they have been much for early in industrialization and they are more responsible for the cumulative emissions. Uh, and developing countries, they are still in industrialization. So that's why their emissions are likely to increase. So I think for me, uh, in terms of uh, international reputation, it does play a role. But for me, I, I think it's mainly from the perspective of uh, representing uh, developing countries and to have a stronger voice in international climate negotiation. Gotcha. One last question before we get into carbon trading. Yen, 
there's a debate about whether or not sort of U.S. China climate cooperation would like mean anything for the future of the world's temperature. Our countries, you know, we, we talked in the beginning of this conversation about how sort of interrelated and interconnected um, global energy markets are to shocks. But I'm curious to what extent you you also see that when it comes to people doing reform on their own energy grids and energy systems. How could more global cooperation help and where does it not really matter? I think more global cooperation helps. Uh, but on, on, on the other hand, I think it's both. Uh, so in, in, let's say, in the EU, uh, it emphasizes a lot on climate leadership or to have, I mean, there's even an idea of a climate club. So which means that the bigger emitters, if they join hands and to have more common opinions or common agreement on, uh, let's say, climate actions, etc., that will help to speed up, uh, again, the global climate efforts. So that is helpful because when bigger countries are dragging uh, forward. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, given what we have seen the past five, six years, collaboration is very difficult. <laughs> There are also the world is, I feel right now in the past, especially after COVID uh, crisis, the world is, uh, uh, there are more and more barriers in the world. So it's very hard to think of uh, collaboration or real collaboration. But on the other hand, I mean, for climate policy, for decarbonization, even competition uh, is good. And let's say we have EU, China, and US competing about uh, about renewable technology, campaigning about uh, EV technology, uh, energy storage. Uh, I mean, th these are what's needed for decarbonization. So in that, uh, collaboration can drive innovation and competition can also drive innovation. All right, switching gears a little bit. Um, the other big news that happened this year is that China launched its emissions trading scheme, right? Could you give like maybe a brief history of the ETS in China and why China would want to implement an ETS? That's, uh, yeah, I can start with, so carbon market, uh, the China's national car carbon market really launched this year after 10 years, exactly 10 years in the making. Um, but for you who are not familiar with carbon trading or ETS, uh, I can say that, so ETS is what we call a compliance carbon market. Uh, that is in contrast to a uh, voluntary or offset carbon market. So in the ETS, government will hand out quotas or allowances, digital, not in paper, <laughs> but there will be a uh, set, there will be a bank, it's called registry, there'll be carbon registry. So the allowances you get will be saved in your account in the registry. And by the end of each year, you have to submit your uh, emissions, your carbon emissions for this year, and you have to hand in the same uh, the uh, same amount of allowances, like equal to your emissions. If you have, so government will hand less and less allowances, basically why to incentive, uh, incentivize companies to reduce emissions. And so if you have less allowances, you have to either let's say, increase your efficiency or produce more cleaner, uh, or you have to buy allowances from others who have surplus. So this is why carbon trading. So in the ETS, what's treated is allowances. So in the world that uh, the European uh, carbon market, the EU ETS, has been in place since 2005, and it accounts for uh, over 80% of global uh, carbon trading volumes uh, in the form of, let's say, uh, spots, futures, <laughs> options, options, etc., all form of financial products. And, and China's national ETS starting this year, uh, and, but it has began the process in 2010. Well, uh, why? Um, I think that uh, because China needs an effective carbon price signal. So as to, so in a market where buyer and seller uh, they trade their allowances, so that can help to um, to form a uh, very effective price signal. So, I mean, that's how a free market it is, and which can really be a uh, cost-effective way of reducing emissions. 
So China has been borrowing a lot of experiences from the EU and also that was including the UK as well in the past years as a lot of uh, knowledge transfer and capacity building. So in this, uh, in this year, China started its national ETS and trading started officially on 16th of July. In terms of covered emissions, I mean, as I said, China is the biggest emitter in the world. So in terms of China's carbon market only covers the power sector. And uh, so basically all of the coal and gas power plants in China and their emissions are around 4.5 gigaton. So that is almost three times more than what the European carbon market covers now or twice of the European carbon market when it was started. So in terms of covered emissions, China's national carbon market is huge. What are some major differences maybe or similarities between the EU ETS and China's ETS, considering that China's carbon market is going to be much larger? Yeah, um, there has been a lot of, uh, so China ETS uh, really has borrowed a lot of experience from the EU ETS. So the structure and et cetera are very similar in terms of how to uh, set, we call a, a benchmark and how to, to basically set the rules on how to hand out allowances. A lot of, it's very similar. A key difference though, is that uh, the target, the one I mean that uh, in the ETS government will hand out less allowances. And in China that uh, the target currently is again, and intensity based target. Uh, so meaning that it's only measured based on per kilowatt hour of your CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour of power output. Uh, so that means there is no absolute amount of emissions in China's ETS on the top. That's in contrast to the EU ETS. In the EU ETS, how much allowances will be handed out uh, each year is already been decided already 10 years ahead and it's in line with the climate target uh, and China currently set a, it's called yeah, intensity or rate based target. Um, but mm, I think we'll, of course, uh, as China has pledged to peak carbon emissions before 2030, uh, so China will eventually set an upper limit on the CO2 emissions and that will really define uh, how many allowances will be covered in the carbon market because China's carbon market is supposed to is covered power sector now uh, around 40% of China's emissions, but it's also uh, aimed to expand to all the industry sectors by 2025. So by then it will cover more than 70% of China's emissions. So let's say the role of carbon trading in China will uh, also has a potential in the next years. So do you think that China's ETS will actually be effective in reducing carbon emissions? Well, that's, let's see what you compare to. I mean, still, uh, when we think of China, that's every mechanism designed in China will be with Chinese characteristics. So yes. And on the other hand, exactly because China has set the, uh, the target to peak emissions before 2030. So there is a lot of uh, regulatory measures or we say command and control already in place. Uh, and uh, the industry sectors I talked about, the steel sector enterprises, uh, et cetera, they already pledged to peak emissions by 2025. So there are already uh, other measures uh, simultaneously being implemented uh, alongside the ETS. So I think that's minimizing the role of what the ETS can play uh, in contrast to what really is happening in Europe. Uh, where we have carbon price of 64 euro per ton today, and in China was around 42 yuan, so 6 euro. And as of, I mean, not holidays closed, but as of its last uh, on 30 September. So the price level was super, uh, quite different. I think a low price level, of course, it will have also minimal impacts on reducing emissions. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, I would say regulate, regulated measures uh, could have bigger impacts in reducing emissions compared to the ETS. But the objective of the ETS, there are two. Uh, one is really to establish a very good carbon or emissions accounting uh, system of the country. I mean, this has been the point where uh, China hasn't been able to establish yet. And let's say, I mean, have you the last official emissions 
for China uh, was in 2014. So yeah, let's see, it's quite lagging behind in terms of uh, THG, we call it, or the greenhouse gas emissions uh, accounting system as you have in Europe, in America, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, but the second is also to use the ETS to start to have a price signal, even though it's low, six euro, but this price signal could uh, provide uh, as a reference for other policies. And I think that carbon, for some sectors, ETS is more suitable, but for, let's say, transport sector, et cetera, uh, maybe a carbon tax is more suitable. Uh, but then the price from the ETS could as a reference when you're setting the tax rate, et cetera, in the future. So there will be multiple policies. There will always be both uh, regulated and market-based. You know, we've seen this dramatic increase in sort of popular attention, yeah. um, at least in the in the U.S. and Europe, towards energy policy. I'm curious, to what extent is, is momentum for climate change and reform a, uh, a popular issue? So I think first of all, when I grew up, I think environmental policy or environmental impacts was uh, much more important. Uh, however, in the past, that's, I think it's really when China, can, when China joined Paris Agreement and made the 2030 uh, climate goals. And that started to make, like I would say, even my parents make ordinary uh, people more aware of climate policies. Because in, yeah, Paris Agreement, etc. And again, I think we have more and more extreme weather events in past years. Uh, I mean, this July is exactly my hometown in Xinjiang, where we had the, it's besides Zhengzhou, and where we, we had the flood one day after each other, uh, the severe flood. Uh, so that's very extreme. But already in 2016, that's in the summer holiday, when I was in Xinjiang, we actually had the same flood in that morning. So extreme weather events is becoming more frequent. So I think that is really driving people's awareness, right? You have, we're seeing more reporting of, yeah, I mean, this is linked to climate change and etc. We have more more heat waves in the summer, more cold snaps in the winter, and more droughts or the severe flood. And so I think that's driving really more people more aware of it. Um, but of course, I any mean, officially what really changed last September until now, I think it's really broad uh, educating of what carbon neutrality is and is really changing. So I, again, as even my parents knows that, I and mean, I'm a carbon analyst for 15 years. And now they understand my job <laughs> uh, after China announced the pledge. So I would say that's a big change. So now it's very easy to explain to them what I do as a carbon analyst. So what do you say? You say, I make sure that China is doing what it, say it, what it says it does? Yeah, I said, I said, no, I make sure some people can earn money. Back to carbon markets, what do you predict for the price of carbon in China? Like, should we be investing in certain ca carbon offsetting companies or something? No. Now it's not allowed um, to, uh, or you can, uh, or what you do, you can register a power plant or a coal plant in China. Uh, now, I think for the national carbon market, the threshold is quite high. You have to be, uh, it's uh, certain, uh, you have to be emitting certain ton of co 2 per year and energy consumption. So it's mainly targeting at the bigger emitters. Um, but what's uh, quite, I mean, we have a price forecast as well as, as my profession, uh, so I think it's with my yeah, evaluation of abatement costs or et cetera on the, yeah, it's very technical, um, but I think that, uh, yeah, something between, yeah, it will be gradually rising. So with carbon market price, uh, we're always gradually rising because why? Because government has reduced the allowances they handed out. And second, carbon price has to increase for it to have, for carbon price to have, they can incentivize emission reduction. So that's two. Um, but in, in addition, I think what's really interesting is in addition to the national carbon market, there are eight regional pilots or uh, provincial or city pilots, which has been existing since 2013. And there are more and more smaller pilots as well, where, I mean, there are, uh, this is all more the general carbon offsetting idea. If you plant a tree, uh, like... In Guangdong, they have the initiative of if you send in your second your second hand clothes, I mean they have a methodology on how to convert that to so like everything you reduce your carbon footprint, and then they can count as you can get certain points or even rewards 
uh, etc. So they, this kind of campaign is uh, picking up as well. What is your like future takes on the carbon capture, utilization, and storage industry? Do you see a lot of investment going into that industry from China? I think there's this is a global effort. Uh, in um, in China, I mean, there are very good literature on that. Even the government published the CCUS a white paper or progress report with a very good map of the or detailed information of the pilot projects. But from the experts, I think that uh, it's uh, the technology is not mature at the moment. It's more in the pilot stage. And in terms of abatement costs, so it's still around at least $80 or $140 per ton. And so quite costly. Uh, I mean, let's say, uh, and also even I, yeah, when I speak to power enterprises, utilities in China, they are less enthusiastic about this because they could have just invested in renewables, right? So the best emission is the one you don't emit. Uh, so I think this is not what could happen in a large scale in the next 10 years. But uh, if we look very long ahead in the 2050 uh, perspective, uh, so China's power sector has to go net zero or, or fully decarbonized by 2050. And so there will be some coal plants or gas plants still running uh, after 2050 uh, when the power system is mainly supported by renewables. But then the last bit of uh, fossil generation will need to be equipped with CCUS. And so I think we, yeah, it's just the time isn't ripe for that now. So right now we, we can follow the uh, pilot schemes and there are some, some of them are quite successful, successful as well, but on a wider scale, I think we have to, at least for the next uh, 10 years. In general, are you optimistic, hopeful for our climate change situation? Uh, me, I think we are, uh, I think after China committed to it, I'm, I'm more optimistic. And it's not because I am Chinese and that, but I think that when the Chinese leadership and Chinese citizens start to be aware of climate change risks, and uh, so I think that will drive a change. So I'm quite optimistic on the Glasgow on COP26. Yeah, and I was actually very nervous on 20, and this year, like uh, 26, 22nd of September in the evening, because really not sure if China will announce new enhanced pledge and it's one year working, but then China really announced we will stop building coal plants abroad. Uh, so I think that, I mean, so for one, of course, we can say China still have a lot of homework to do regarding coal plants inside China, but I think that Chinese leadership is building upon its pledges. It's a very positive signal. So this makes me quite optimistic on the upcoming climate.